receivers. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is a Public Works podcast. My name is Joseph Blackman. Today, I got a real treat for you. His name is Chris Evers, and he is the co-founder of the PWD Roundtable, and then he's also a representative for Pavement Technology, Inc., and then also a whole bunch of other stuff, too, we're going to dive into. So, Chris, say what's up to everybody. Joseph, what's up? Hey, everybody. Good to, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Sure thing, man. Sure thing. So first and foremost, um, let's talk about what your day to day is. You're a representative for Pavement Tech Inc. Um, tell us what that is, what, what problem yeah, sure. you guys solve and what you're doing with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Pavement Technology Inc. is a, a company that was founded back in 1972 before I was even born. Uh, but basically what we do is we're in the business of pavement preservation. Uh, and so we spray apply an asphalt rejuvenator on roadways uh, and it, the, the intent is to extend the life of those pavements. And recently we developed a new technology that enables us to actually also capture NOx, CO2 emissions, uh, decompose microplastic pollution, and also mitigate for something uh, Phoenix is familiar with, which is urban heat island effect. Uh, so we we actually uh, did a, a few projects out in the desert a couple summers ago and uh, growing actually have a, a project coming up in uh, Tempe uh, here in uh, just about a month. Yeah, we for sure need that because it's interesting. <laughs> like it'll be hot in the day, like 105, right? Yeah. But at night you can still feel it coming from the from the pavement. It's like That's what's going it. on. And that then you is, go to the grass and it's like, oh, this is actually a nice night. It's just when you're That is the of exact definition of urban heat island effect. And what happens is the built environment, like our city streets uh, and our roofs, uh, basically absorb the energy from the sun all day. They get hot and then they re-emit that. It's called emissivity and it's emitting all of that heat that it's captured throughout the day. So what we're doing is, is almost like putting sunscreen on the pavements and it uses uh, titanium dioxide to reflect uh, the UV radiation from the sun. And therefore, uh, these pavements don't uh, stay hot and re-emit that heat throughout the uh, the nighttime hours. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, we need pretty cool. To, yeah, that, that, that's pretty cool. Um, and then also, let's talk about the Public Works Director's Roundtable. So, and, and, and I, I'll kind of caveat this. So, you're not necessarily in public works, but you, you, you have a product or service that does serve the, the public works, I guess, industry. Um, and you, you started, you co-founded this roundtable. So tell us what, kind of what your plight is and what, I guess, problem you aim to solve with the roundtable. Sure. Absolutely, Joseph. Uh, well, the cool thing was back in 2012, I was uh, elected uh, as the uh, president of the Florida chapter here. And th that was a, a real defining moment, was really excited about that. Um, and that was coming off of that 2009, uh, 10 kind of uh, brutal great recession. Uh, so we had seen our uh, numbers dip. We actually had been the largest chapter in the country uh, and we lost that. Florida was particularly hard hit for that crisis. Um, and so we lost a lot of members. And in the process of kind of rebuilding the Florida chapter, uh, we thought, you know, we need to uh, engage with these public works directors uh, and really get them to come to our public works expo, which we have every year. So myself and another individual, Chaz Jordan, uh, founded this public works director roundtable. And you're right, I, I am in public works, but I'm not in the public sector. So I'm a private sector public works guy. Uh, and have been my whole working career. But the idea was really to get this uh, round table where we could allow uh, all the public works directors to network with each other and we would have uh, certain topics. And during these topics, these uh, round tables would discuss the uh, topic at, uh, at hand and then uh, try to come up with solutions. And then as we would uh, wrap up that topic, we would actually uh, you know, give everyone the mic or not everyone, but but uh, each table would get the mic and discuss some of the solutions. And what we found was these public works directors were extremely excited about the ability to be in a room with just their peers. There was no one else in there. Everyone there is a public works director or equivalent or might be deputy director. Um, and so it gave them the ability to really hop in and talk about some of the challenges that their agencies uh, might be facing at the time. Um, and as such, you know, we were really in the in the position to uh, kind of our tagline was uh, where directors go to grow. And it was a personal development for uh, Paul Works directors. So 
we got a lot of great feedback. Um, that was back in 2012, 2013. Um, and then in 2014, we took that to uh, PWX at the time it was called Congress. Um, and so uh, we've done uh, eight years of, uh, of uh, PWX uh, International Poll Works Director Roundtables because uh, there we have folks from Canada or Scandinavia or, or some other, uh, you know, uh, New Zealand, Australia. So uh, we've kind of taken it to, to, to that uh, international degree as well. But it's, it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. And, and it's one of the, uh, you know, uh, really uh, uh, better attended, better uh, rated sessions in all uh, PWX. We tell them you're really rating yourself. And, and so that seems to resonate because they all give each other, uh, you know, uh, uh, top, no top notch marks. So it's pretty, pretty cool. You know, I, I like that concept because, I mean, I'm a part of APWA down here in Arizona. Yep. And, like, monthly meetings are tough because, like, again, I'm, I'm a vendor. I'm, a, I'm into public works, but I'm not in the public sector. And it's mostly 80 90% like vendors. You know? Right. And it's like, okay, where are the public works employees to be able to come and network? And, and I kind of understand it because a lot of them don't want to get pitched. They don't want to see the right. guy that, you know, tried to sell them a month ago and he's trying to follow up and all that. They just kind of, like you said, they want to go somewhere where they can grow. So talk to the value of, uh, of it, it could be any industry, getting around like-minded people in it, in and I guess in a way that isn't, um, I don't want to say combative, but not a high pressure uh, room to where you're trying to, where somebody's trying to sell you. Yeah, that was what we did was we really decided, hey, let's make this, uh, you know, closed off. Uh, there is a sponsor. It's usually one sponsor and they do kind of a quick pitch, uh, you know, early on to say, hey, you know, here's what we're about. Um, but other than that, it's, uh, you know, no kind of sales in the uh, roundtable. It's all about, you know, uh, personal development for the directors. And that really enabled us to very quickly build a, a, a kind of a, a following amongst the directors. And so uh, we had tracked the metrics. We used to only get, you know, uh, maybe 10 or 12, uh, you know, directors that would come to our expo. And in the first year that grew to about 40, 45 directors. And we've had as many as, you know, uh, close to a hundred uh, at one time before. And then at PWX, obviously you've got a bigger audience. Um, so, you know, it can, it can swell, but it's, it's been very rewarding to see their reaction to it. Um, and it's one of my, you know, favorite things to do is to, is to moderate that session and just, uh, you know, throw some, some, some things at the wall and see what sticks. And, and, you know, I've heard a lot of feedback where they say, you know, I took some of those ideas back to my community and we really made a lot of progress because of the way the round table, uh, you know, functioned and learning from my, my peers. Yeah. Yeah. And then talk about just in general association, we're both a part yeah. of APWA. Yeah. Uh, let's say you're giving advice to somebody they're, they're fresh out of college or into the industry and they're on the fence. I'm like, why should I join an association? Like, why should I pay the X amount of dollars? to go and, you know, to, to pay more money to go to these events and then, you know, maybe get around people that I like, maybe I get around people that might buy from me in the future. What's the value in it? What do you say to people like that? Yeah, I, I definitely, I, cause I've been in that position. I was uh, sitting in a, in a director's office. This uh, uh, gentleman's name was uh, Cheech DeSellis. He's a, a, a former top 10 uh, recipient. And I remember just sitting there talking to him about, you know, how I could help maybe, um, you know, I guess in a, in a way selling him on what we did. Uh, and he asked me, are you a member of APWA? And at the time I, I was like, no, not yet. I mean, I just moved to Florida. This was at the time it was 2001. I said, I just moved here a couple months ago. And he was like, well, get back to me once you've uh, joined. So it was kind of like, oh, okay. All right. I, I better get involved. But I think more than anything, Joseph, um, really, you've probably heard the, the saying, you know, your network is your net worth. Um, and so it really gets to that point where, you know, if first you have to be of, of service to others, uh, you know, to, to really, you've, you've got to have that service mentality. And so I always felt like uh, the more I could get in and, and make an impact and help uh, these different associations, because I'm involved in other ones as well. Uh, but I always felt like the first thing I have to do is give. Um, when you go into anything, you know, in life it, with that uh, receiving mentality, um, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, first of all, that's just really not, you know, what, what we as, as children are even taught, uh, you know, is, is the, the gift is to give. 
Um, and I've found that any gift that I received happened after I first gave a hundred percent of myself. Um, and so that's the way I've always, you know, treated it. So it always came from that place of service. How do I add value to others first? Uh, you know, so you can't think of just enriching yourself. Uh, that's just the wrong approach. But uh, unfortunately, we have a, a, an environment and a, and a uh, kind of mentality today or the new generations do of, you know, instant gratification. Uh, they have that kind of that uh, TikTok attention span, if you will. And so, you know, they think, you know, OK, one minute after I get involved, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the rain is going to come. And, and it's just not like that. Uh, you have to give for years and years and years. But what I've found after that is it's just uh, it, it's a, a life of abundance. And, and that's what we really should be focused on is, is not the scarcity, but the abundance. Uh, so that's what I've always tried to do. Gosh, you're uh, you're saying some some pretty profound things, and I wish that like every sales manager can listen to this because I mean you're in sales also, and they hire sure. some new guy, and they're like, "All right, what have you done for me lately?" Like oh, get yeah. out there and sell something. And the problem is, is that if you haven't, like you said, if you haven't gave, give, 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 if you haven't sowed those seeds into that association or to that customer or to that industry, how can you expect to reap? So it's like the sales manager wants you to go out there and reap, 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 sell, sell, sell. Well, like, no, the guy needs to be able to go out there, go to these events, take donuts to the operators, you know, do, do, you know, uh, lunchbox, you know, talks, do some, you know, free demos and stuff like that to be able to build that goodwill. Then in the future, the sales will come, but you're right. We're in this short-sighted, I guess, uh, atmosphere where, what have you done for me lately? Like get out there and get it done yesterday. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. No, absolutely. You're right. And I mean, it, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I think rather than practice a pitch, if you're new, uh, you should practice asking uh, the right questions uh, because the, the, the really the value is asking the questions of, you know, how can I be of service? How can I help? What kinds of challenges are you having? You, you should never go in or my personal opinion is that don't go in there uh, pitching your product. You don't even know if they need your product yet. So what you need to you know figure out is do some fact finding and try to understand you know what is it that your community may be facing uh what is it that's, that's challenging your department um and and pick at that and try to figure out you know okay is there is there some angles here where you know what i do could be of service and oftentimes i mean my my principle has always been um you know, I'll do what I can to help regardless of whether I see any path to uh, how that's going to help me, because I know those paths all open up once I've been of service to that individual. So I, I just want to be that first phone call uh, when somebody has a challenge and it's within, you know, the approximate sphere of influence that I can be. If there's a pavement involved, you know, uh, then then I'm game. I'm, I'm there to, to help them out. So. Sure, sure. So we talk about giving. Let's talk about receiving. You received an award. You beat me out. Uh, not that I applied for it, but <laughs> you the top 10 awards. That means you're in the top 10 uh, in the world of X, Y, and Z. So tell us what the world or the, the award is about and then what, like, who gave it to you and how you got it. Oh, yeah, that, that was exciting. I um, was uh, lucky enough to have been nominated by the Florida chapter of APWA. And so every year, uh, the uh, APWA Nationals uh, hands out uh, an award that's been around since 1960. So there's been uh, over 600 uh, recipients of this award, uh, 10 per year, obviously. And so what it's really there is to recognize, you know, kind of the best of the best in the public works uh, arena, um, specifically APWA. And so uh, once I was nominated, there's a, a long you know process that goes on and it's like a a 20 page nomination form of just everything you've done uh, over your public works career. And so, you know, after that's uh, put in, uh, after you're nominated, then there's a process where they, they go through all of those around the, the country and they whittle those down to the uh, top 10 recipients for, from that year. And so it's a, uh, it's a, a very prestigious award. It's, it's probably the most uh, prestigious award from APWA anyway. Um, and so, I mean, I was, overblown like I, I was kind of couldn't believe you know when I heard I was nominated I was like that's incredible you know it didn't really have any expectations because the other thing Joseph is it's it's more rare to to you know receive that award if you're on the private sector I'd say eight or nine out of the ten is usually you know public sector uh you know public works directors or city or county engineers or some sort of uh you know public works uh you know uh agency member 
And so, you know, I didn't have, you know, any expectations. I just was like, well, that's amazing. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, and so to stand up on stage and, and receive that in San Diego this year was, was really the culmination of a lot of hard work and, and, uh, you know, was kind of a defining moment for me as a, a big smile on my face, I, I should say. So it was, it was awesome. Yeah. No, congratulations for that. Uh, let's say, um, let's say we're mentoring some youngsters and they ask you, they say, Hey, Chris, like, what skill set should I pick up to, you know, be a top 10 awardee recipient or just to be, I guess, a shaker and mover in our industry to be somebody that can put together a public works director round table or just to have the clout that you have in this industry? What would that skill set be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you really want to have is a, a burning desire uh, to to do good. I mean, the, the, the one thing that I found is that I, I always wanted to stretch the boundaries and be aggressive uh, for good uh, and, and really add value. Uh, the, the thing that I wanted to leave people, because they, they won't remember what you do, they will remember how you made them feel. And so, you know, I always uh, wanted to be there, uh, be present and, and try to be of service to them at all times. So um, I always would volunteer for things. Uh, you know, I took on uh, as much or more than I could handle at, at any one time. Uh, and so anything that I could do, you know, to, to be in that arena and be of service, not only in APWA, but whether that's the uh, Florida Association of County Engineers and Road Superintendents here in Florida, which is associated with uh, NACE, uh, or the Florida Pavement Preservation Council, you know, any of these other, you know, entities, it was a matter of how can I be of service when I'm there present with them. And so for mentoring, I think the biggest thing is just is try to, you know, obviously hone your craft. Um, you have to stick around long enough to, to make it, you know, to the top. So, uh, you know, I think today's mentality for, you know, the, these uh, younger generations is to move around a lot. You really, if you find the right industry, you want to try to stay in that industry. You, you've probably seen that too. I mean, you you, you can't bounce around um, because you you it takes a lifetime to become uh, well regarded and well known, and your reputation comes a lot from your both your efforts but also your longevity. So I think too often people will tend to to bounce here and there and everywhere in pursuit of that perfect uh, world instead of trying to instead of trying to make the world that they're in perfect. And I think that's what we uh, we need to do is really focus on the sphere of influence that we're in right now instead of trying to look for the next best thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I like that. My mentor told me when I was kind of in a, a point in life where I didn't have really – I had jobs, but I didn't have like a career. Like I right. wasn't in an industry. I was just kind of doing the millennial hop and dance. And uh, he said, no, find an industry where you, you – know, like a long-term industry with long-term people. Yep. And that's where, like, and, and I got into public works. I'm like, oh, this is it. Like, yep. the, like you and I will talk 10 years from now. You get what I'm oh, saying? Oh, absolutely. I can't wait. I mean, I can wait, but, but you're right. And, and that's the but, thing. It, that's Public works is a family. And so if you find a place that you're lucky enough, and, and I do think, you, you and I both agree, I think public works is that place. But for, you know, those folks out there still in that search, go for uh, the, the feeling of family. If you can feel like you're in a family and you see other people around you to where they're engaged and involved and they're, you know, asking about each other's families and you can tell there's that familial, you know, kind of uh, uh, feeling around the place, that's where you want to be. Uh, you want to be there and you want to be able to, you know, really grow with that uh, community and, and help that community grow. Uh, and that's, that's where you're going to be best off, uh, best served, in my opinion. Sure, sure. All right, it's story time. Let's I need do a it. story from Chris of when something went wrong under your watch, what you did to fix it, and then give us the lesson you learned from it to apply to your future career. Yes, well, that's a tough one uh, because you know I think you know my saying has always been that a, a problem is an opportunity in early stage development, right? So you you can't get anywhere in life without solving these problems. And so, you know, we always look at it as, um, okay, uh, what problem can I solve today? And so, you know, for me, I think one of the toughest things has, has been how do I, you know, kind of, I, I guess, multiply myself, if you will, clone myself. So the problem that, that I look back that, that we all probably will kind of appreciate is, is COVID, frankly. Uh, you and I are in a relational business. 
And so if uh, somebody all of a sudden tells you, you can't go out and see people, you got to sit in your home uh, and do what we're doing right now, which people didn't used to do. Uh, it's, it's a blow. I mean, uh, you know, I know that, that our company was bracing for just literally like cratering, you know, sales, uh, cratering projects. Um, you know, this is going to be a disaster preparing for the absolute worst. What are we going to do to keep our employees? And I, my, my mentality of, and my, you know, philosophy was immediately, I seized on this as this is a tremendous opportunity. This will revolutionize uh, the way we do business in, in this kind of fashion that we'll be doing more of, of this, there will be advantages to that because I won't have to fly out to Phoenix uh, and, and spend all that time on a plane to try to you know, engage with you. Uh, not only that, um, we'll find efficiencies that we never thought we could find before. We, we always thought Public Works is kind of that old school uh, you know, kind of industry where we did everything over a handshake and in, in front of each other. And so we didn't do pre-construction meetings on, on virtual like platforms like Zoom or, or, or Teams. We didn't do a lot of these webinars. We did like technical sessions in person. And so I remember telling the owner of the company, the owner of the PTI, I was like, I, I'm going to look at this differently. First of all, I think this will be a record year for us. Uh, I think one of the reasons is uh, that if we just drive hard and, and work hard and, and learn these new platforms, it's going to serve us for subsequent years, for one thing. But the other thing is I said, think of the production we'll get uh, when there's no traffic on the roads. So we were doing work uh, where we were you know, operating at twice the speed. Yes, we had to you know, have more personal protective uh, you know, gear on and, and mask up and everything. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I mean, we were in... In May, we were in uh, Key West when, when everything was shut down down there. We were first responders, and we were doing two and a half times the, the, uh, the volume of production uh, than the normal because there was no one on the streets. And so, you know, I think the biggest thing for me was to remain positive and look at it as, okay, what is the opportunity that's coming from this unique problem? And I have to say, the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. And so it, it got me excited and it has paid dividends. And, and, and don't get me wrong, COVID is a terrible, terrible thing. But, but the reaction and the uh, ability to take this terrible pandemic and turn it into something positive um, is, is harder to do for a lot of people. And so I just looked at that as a differentiator for what we could do and I could do personally. And so uh, since then, we've had literal exponential growth in our business because people identified uh you know with some of the things we do and we were able to bring some of this new technology that we didn't have before yeah i and i say the same thing and i always have to caveat and say yeah COVID was bad like i'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to say it's not but the good things that came out of it like we got so much more efficient like I remember training like some of the guys I work with who were uh, you know of age. I had to sh tell them, uh, show them how to work a shared document. Like I can literally change something on my computer in the other office, and they'll see a change on their computer in their office. So like, whoa, exactly. what's going on? Exactly. You know, I've been like these these video calls, and then like the time we get back from not having to commute whether it's like getting your kids off to school or getting them breakfast or like, you know, at the end of the day, you don't have to drive home and, and be pissed off when you get home because you're in road rage all day. Like that, that type of stuff compounds. And it, oh, you know, for it, sure. it adds, it adds certain moments and value to our life that a lot of people don't really look at. Yes. COVID was bad, but there's a lot of good that came out of it for sure. Exactly. Definitely. Yeah. So how does Chris keep showing up year after year, day after day, month after month, better and better? What's your personal and professional development regimen like? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, first of all, I, I try to wake up and do some exercise first thing in the morning. Uh, that really helps kind of get the juices flowing. Uh, the other thing that I uh, really work hard on myself is is a lot of, uh, uh, I, I'm on Audible quite a bit. So I, I do a lot of personal development. I try to hit the, the 50 books a year. I don't always get there, but uh, and, and the COVID year was also a banner year for, for uh, reading. Uh, we got a lot done because there just wasn't as much to do, so uh, frankly. But uh, so a lot of it really surrounds for me as a, a lifetime of education. I think too often we spend uh, the time in the cars. And, and certainly for me, you know, I do drive around to projects and I cover the whole state of Florida or I might be on a plane out to the, you know, uh, the West Coast, um, you know, or, or the mountains. So 
those are times and if you start adding up the amount of time that you could spend in personal development um, it's the equivalent of a, a college education repeated every few years and people don't realize that as far as the number of credit hours that it takes I like about you know i think it's 120 credit hours for you know colleges um, and so if you start adding up you know the kind of time that you can devote to it um, I consume uh, educational uh, infotainment, I guess you could call it, because some of it's uh, entertaining as well, but on YouTube. I mean, I'm on YouTube all the time. Um, I also, you know, through the Florida Payment Preservation Council, I teach a, a bi-monthly webinar, which is 90 minutes. Of, and, and if you can teach a subject, that also shows some mastery too. So there's personal development in that because it takes, it takes me, you know, probably 10 hours to create one hour of, of content. And I think we're up to over 35 hours through the uh, Florida LTAP Center of pre-recorded content. So you can almost binge watch like Netflix, you know, we're on uh, uh, season three or whatever it would be for, for pavement preservation. So, so that's the, that's the key yeah. for me is, is the personal development never stops. If you stop developing yourself, uh, then in a, in a way you've kind of admitted defeat and you're just going to be slowly, slowly dying, if you will. Totally, totally. I, I remember I wrote a blog article years ago, and it was about kind of the Game of Thrones doing. It was like set. It was like ten seasons or seven seasons of like ten episodes. Yep. And I'm like, that's seventy hours. Like, let's say everybody read a book for seventy hours. Like, you could probably get thirty pages done in an hour. Like, that's that's roughly three, four books, maybe. Or no, wait. If my math is correct. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of books. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of books. Of, yeah. yeah, it's a lot of stuff I, you can I, download. That's, in. that's ten. Like my books are usually five, six, seven hours on Audible. So you yep. could be yep. talking about ten, twelve books yeah. or more. And I mean, yeah. the the great thing about listening to books uh, for me is when I'm out walking the dog, I can I can listen to you know five or six pages worth or whatever it is, depending on how energetic he is that night. Uh, but you know, so there's a lot that you can do. Uh, so you know, I'm not a TV guy. I don't watch any, um, I would say any regular, you know, season things. I'll sit down and probably my attention span too. I just can't, can't deal with it. But uh, so I, you, you don't want to be the, the, you know, asking me about Yellowstone or, or uh, you know, billions or suits or whatever it's on now. I don't really know. I'm probably way behind, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to be the right person to ask for that. But if you have any questions about, Entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial stuff or, you know, uh, uh, any investments. I love, you know, that side of the house, you know, outside of my normal, you know, leadership type stuff. Uh, you know, I'm your Huckleberry. I'd be the, the, the right guy to, to ask. Sure. And then like on the pavement side, let's say a youngster is saying, Hey, Chris, like I, I'm, I'm fresh to the industry. Of course I can follow Chris around and, and download everything he has in his brain. But how do they hack that? Like, do you yeah. do you advise them going to seminars? Do you advise them just diving into like white papers on pavement and stuff? Like, how does one tactically learn more about the industry that they're in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, in my uh, humble opinion, I think all of the above is the right way to do it. There's not a lot of um, uh, audio books on pavement preservation. Maybe I'm onto something. You gave me an idea. I need to do, you know, some of that myself. But um, the, the one thing is there are a, a preponderance of webinars now. So, you know, as I said, we have a ton of content. There's other content all over uh, the web. And so I think the biggest thing is to, you know, try to find someone to follow. Uh, LinkedIn is a great resource. You can scroll through and, and, and meet, uh, you know, uh, virtually meet, you know, contacts that, that are experts in their field. And so I always look at, at uh, those places. As far as social media platforms, I, I, kind of grown when I think about, you know, engaging on social media, uh, but not when it comes to LinkedIn. Like that's how you and I kind of connected is on uh, LinkedIn. And so I, I like meeting, you know, folks there. Certainly, you know, if you're young, you can try to engage with people, ask a lot of questions. That's the, the kind of the top advice I would have is just get in there, go to as many conferences as, as your employer will let you go to. And I think that is the key is just uh, getting into the industry and you can't really do that from, um, you know, just your desk. You can learn a lot online, but if you can get out go to these conferences, uh, you know, get around the people that are, you know, kind of the subject matter experts, you're going to be much better off. No, hundred percent. Whenever, whenever I go to it, it's kind of like, Oh, I got this conference next week. It's going to be like 900 bucks. 
and then I'm gonna go. I don't know anybody there. I might know some people there, and here's the stuff I want to do. But then you 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 go to you leave the conference, and you're so much more energized. For you're sure. inspired. You're like motivated to go. Oh, like I can actually you know put my stamp on the world through this industry, or through this problem I'm trying to solve. Definitely. And it's like you don't get that from just being on your computer all day. Trust no, me, and I mean. $900. So imagine if you look at the cost of college these days, uh, it's not that much. I mean, some of these conferences, uh, the one I was at uh, recently in Indianapolis, the uh, National Pavement Preservation Conference, it's only every four years. But in essence, the attendees would spend $600, but it was four days and they were eight hours long. So you had, you know, basically you could go to 30 plus hours of uh, learning uh, you know, for, for $600. So I know there's the cost of yeah. travel, but uh, there's no better investment than the investment of time and learning in yourself, you know? So investing in yourself is the number one thing you should do. And in fact, if you don't have a lot of money, that's what you want to do. You want to invest in getting better, getting, you know, uh, uh, all the different life hacks that will help you to, you know, kind of achieve those goals. And then the biggest thing for me is just, setting big goals. I mean, you know, if you're not, if you're not failing at the goal most of the time, then your goal is just not big enough. I mean, you, you should not be, you know, hitting 80% of your targets. If you are, your targets are way too small. And so, you know, it's, it's just hard to grow. Now, once you achieve a target, you do need to go in and make sure that you're adding another bigger target. You can't just turn it into a maintenance. Okay. I hit this you know, big goal. Now I just want to maintain it. Now nope, you got to, you got to look to, to hit doubles and triples, you know, from those, uh, those goals. And in, in my opinion, Gosh, I love now you're talking like an entrepreneur, man. That's, that's stuff we need to hear. You know? That's it. It is. It's valuable. I mean, it, you know, too often we set these, you know, small targets and I, and I hear about people that get excited about, you know, these uh, single digit, you know, growth, and it's like um, you need an X behind that to just anytime if it, my, my take on it is if you just replace the percentage with an X. So instead of, uh, you know, 3%, 3 X, you need to you need to do that. 10% growth. Yeah. Now take the percentage out and put an X there. And now we're talking that's because that's what you're going to get excited about. You're not going to get excited with single digit growth. Yeah. And then what the beautiful thing about setting these huge goals is that like if you put an X next to five, five X, right? Yep. The amount of activity you're doing today will probably get you 5% of increase, but five X will force your brain to start finding ways to exponentially increase your activity so you yep. can have the result of a five X return. And like as humans, we want problems to solve. And that problem that our brain gets forced into to create that five X return it's like it's like doing drugs, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, there's no better uh, drug than than not the X that everyone's thinking about, but it's the X, the 10X drug, if you will. It's the it's the factor of of multiplying instead of just addition and subtraction. Is you, you need to get into that because it, it it's not about the scarcity of things. Uh, it's a limitless world, limitless potential, and so I think too often, you know, we we get to, we hear this. Um, uh, you know, you're thinking too big or you're a dreamer or whatever. And it's like, um, you know, you need to do something that's going to excite you. If not, you're going to have a tough time getting out of bed. Plus, I mean, we saw what inflation was over the last uh, two or three years. You better be in the X mentality or you're going to have a tough time, uh, you know, making making the bills, uh, you know, uh, uh, get, get those yeah. paid every month. So. And hundred percent, like a lot of people, they realized during COVID when their jobs weren't safe and secure and comfortable yep. that like they needed a side gig or a side hustle or something right. to do that like they can create and take it to market and make some money from it because wow. that job might not be there all the time. So definitely, definitely. It yeah. likely won't if you're not careful. Exactly. All right. So we could talk about this all day, every day, but um, I, I always like to put this out there this way. What's like the biggest misconception about what you do? Like, let's say we ask one of your, your golf buddy, like, Hey, what does Chris do for the community, for society, for his, his business, for APWA? What would he yeah. get totally wrong in answering that question? Wow. I, that, that's a, that's an interesting question. I haven't been asked that question before. They, the, the one thing is you probably won't find a lot of golf buddies cause I suck at golf. The first thing they would say is they're like, do not invite him to play golf. I, I do have an APWA golf tournament in, uh, in two days. And, um, and so the thing they got wrong was inviting me to be on their golf team first and foremost. They're like, that guy's terrible. 
So, but seriously, we have a lot of fun out there. I, I think the one thing that they may, uh, you know, get wrong is, um, I, I think a lot of times they think, it, you know, that it was uh, easy or that it was lucky because I, 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 I do a lot of uh, things and, and the common kind of reaction is, oh, it all works out, even from my family. I mean, you know, my wife would say, it always works out for him. Uh, you know, he's lucky, you know, like that. But, but in all honesty, you know, it's you make your own luck. And I think what has probably preceded that luck is effort and action. So if you don't have effort or action, you're going to have a tough time getting lucky. Uh, if you have the effort and action, then the luck is what follows that. And then the result follows that. So, you know, you, you really have to be active to be lucky. And so, you know, you don't get lucky from no engagement. And so I think if you ask somebody, they might say, oh, Evers is just, he's got lucky charms. I mean, he, he's such a lucky guy. Everything works out for that guy. And first, that's definitely not the case. That, so that's wrong. Uh, but when you, you know, go full tilt at something and you have huge goals, um, fail is just an acronym for first attempt in learning, right? And so that failure is where you come up with the strategies to get around that, that first attempt in learning and get that second attempt to work out. So what probably has happened in, in uh, you know, for, for colleagues that look at me and say, oh man, he, look at, he scored on that one. That's amazing, you know, luck that he has is they didn't maybe see all of the times that I fell flat on my face and, 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 you know, just did not make it, make it happen. Um, so I, I would say that's probably the biggest misconception, um, you know, what people might, you know, think of. Sure. Sure. I like that. All right. Let's say I'm coming to Vero beach. That's, that's around where you're at, right? Yes, I am I'm coming to Vero beach. And I, I text you ahead of time. I'm like, Hey, Chris, where can I go to get the best burger in town? Where are you going to send me? Okay. Well, there'd be two answers to that. The, if you had enough time uh, for a three hour drive, because we were having so much fun today, uh, we would hop in the car and I would actually drive you uh, due west to my old haunt in St. Petersburg to El Cap. They have one of the best burgers around. But if you were short on time, honestly, what I would do, uh, Joseph, I invite you over to the house and I would make you an Evers uh, kind of smash burger inspired by the movie you know i do occasionally watch movies but uh is the menu and that's uh that's where um uh, ray finds who's the you know in the movie and the kind of the eccentric chef at the very end he makes the uh, other uh, lead character in the movie this amazing burger that that we decided hey let's try to replicate that so we you know got the cast iron skillet out and and i gotta say i've got it down to kind of a science uh, using you know, uh, uh, meat that's basically kind of the uh, ground shuck, not like lean, super lean. It's got to have some fat in it. And then yeah. uh, make sure you got, uh, you know, some onions, onion burger kind of, uh, and salt and pepper, and then just, uh, you know, smash it. And then, and then one of the keys is using uh, American cheese, which I used to think I hated that stuff. I'm like, that stuff is plastic, nasty cheese. But in this burger, it's really special. So, so yeah, I'd have you over and we'd, uh, we'd grab a, a beverage of your choice and, and you could just uh, sit there over a, uh, a, a juicy uh, burger and, and talk public works. <laughs> Love it, man. Love it, man. Absolutely. Chris Evers burger. That's it. Sorry. That's it. Um, Absolutely. I always like to leave a space on the show for you to think mentors that you had along your journey. And then also, I mean, you've been motivational enough, but give a word of motivation to everybody else out there who's, I guess on the sales path, fighting their battles, you know, they're, they're doing their deal. Absolutely. Well, I, I have, I've been fortunate enough to have some amazing mentors. Uh, when I started this, uh, this journey back in the mid nineties, I started working for a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Charles Koch, uh, one of the Koch brothers, the, the uh, uh, well-known Koch brothers, uh, uh, amazing guy, very, you know, misunderstood himself. Um, but I, I got to interact a little bit with him uh, when he uh, came to visit our, our plant. And then I've since just, he's 87 now. I was just reading a, 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 a article in Forbes about him this morning. But, it, you know, it, it, a lot of great, amazing uh, tidbits that, that I learned around his philosophy called market-based management. I encourage anybody to, to read, uh, you know, some of his books like Good Profit or, uh, you know, uh, um, 
the science of people, I believe is one of the other ones. Um, so great guy. Uh, and then since it's, uh, I'm lucky enough that one of my mentors is the owner of the company, uh, Colin Durante, who uh, is just an amazing force. It was a, a presidential award winner and from APWA back a, a number of years ago. And he, he is just a, a inspiration in our industry. He's a real pioneer. Uh, he's the one who developed this uh, smog eating roads technology. And I marvel, you know, even at his you know age that he is still just, you know, he could easily have retired, you know, uh, 15, 20 years ago, but he shows up every day. And, and that's kind of where my advice comes is show up every day. Uh, I try to be the, the, the uh, uh, if not the first one, you know, up because I, you know, I, I wouldn't say I get up at four or five or anything ridiculous, but, um, but I definitely am the, the, the person that's going to stick around the longest and, and be in the, you know, in a situation to put myself in a place to, whether that be interact with somebody new, make new friends, uh, interact with old ones, and just be there. So you, it's kind of one of those adages: uh, it must be present to win. So even at these conferences, uh, even at uh, you know the number of years I've been doing this, you know, uh, twenty-seven years, uh, I'm stay up too late. I mean, I, I, I honestly, I, I don't get as much sleep at these conferences because I'll interact with them. Uh, there's usually social activities at the end of the night. And, uh, and I'll be there to the bitter end talking and, and uh, laughing and, and uh, carrying on and such. So uh, even with the younger folks, try to try to keep up with them. So so that's that's it. I think it's it's just the important thing is that you stay you know, humble and true to yourself and, and keep a high ethical standard and then get out there and do as much as you possibly can. You know, you you really will surprise yourself at how many things you can take on. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a, a yes man and that, uh, that I, I will say yes until I absolutely have to say no, as far as taking on, uh, you know, uh, other, other activities and, and other things to do. So. Love it. Love it. Well, Chris, thank you for hopping on the podcast. Absolutely. The out there, make sure you share this with somebody who you think needs to hear it. Any final words before we get out of here? No, I think uh, I think the biggest thing is that uh, we're an amazing in an amazing industry. You know, Public Works is uh, first to respond and last to leave. And so, I just salute all of the folks out there in this industry. If you're not in this industry and you're listening, you really ought to take a look at it. Uh, but we have just the most amazing professionals from the field personnel who are out there getting it done uh, on the crews. They're putting themselves at risk. Um, I think one of the things that we, you know, have to do is tip our hats. Those guys and gals out there put their put themselves in harm's way, uh, and and oftentimes are are uh, uh, you know the the recipients of some pretty terrible you know accidents potentially um, because they are right there in harm's way. So obviously we tip our hats to the um, police and fire, but public works deserves to be in that first responder uh, category and conversation. And so, you know, the biggest thing for me is just always, you know, how can we help them and how can we, uh, you know, do uh, do right by the industry and make sure that the general public appreciates uh, everything that, uh, that goes on in the uh, public works arena. Sure. Sure. Good stuff. All right, Chris. Well, once again, thanks for hopping Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks Joseph. Public, yeah. This has been the public works podcast. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Absolutely.